Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of New Growth. I am your host, Nikki Walton. And today I am excited to continue this teacher series that I'm doing, wherein I get to speak with the people that have had the biggest impact on my spiritual journey. And today I have the pleasure of virtually sitting down with Richard Lang of the Headless Way Teachings. Um, You can find some of the work at headless.org. Thank you so much, Richard, for joining us. You're very welcome, Nikki. Uh, Pleasure to be here. Oh my goodness. This is like, I know I say this every episode, y'all, but this is like full circle because Douglas Harding's Headless Way Teachings was probably one of the first, or maybe it may have been one, truly one of the first teachings that I came across after finding um, self-inquiry, like Atma Vachara via uh, Ramana Maharshi. So I was already well into my journey um, as far as the inquiry goes. But I remember, I believe I was reading a Sam Harris book. And toward the back of that book, he discussed Douglas Harding in this headless way. And I immediately put that book down and started Googling and came across Uh the experiments online. And I came across his first book and his awakening experience. And it felt like I had found my home, like my people, my tribe. So I basically downloaded and ordered every single book I could that he had, you know, um, printed. And I also watched any um, interviews that were online, like on YouTube that had been posted. Mm-hmm. And that's when I found you and your mm-hmm. books. <laughs> and so then I read mm-hmm. all of your books and I um, watched your experiments. Your experiment videos really made his teaching real. It made it even more experiential somehow. And yeah, it just opened up the self-inquiry for me. It made it very, even more direct to be able to just see. And it did take me several months of pointing (laughs) to get there. So I don't want to get too far ahead. I just wanted to give y'all some background as to how I found um, Richard, which was in about 2013. And your teachings also led me down the path of like JC... Is it Amber Shell? Amber Shell? Amber Shell, yeah. Yes, his teachings, which it's all just in alignment and beautiful. So I'll let you introduce um, to the audience exactly what headlessness is. And I know some of you are not actually watching us, that you're just listening. So if you can maybe click on YouTube later and watch the video, it'll probably be more helpful. Well, thank you, Nikki. And uh, a pleasure to hear that you have been... uh, Bitten by the headless way, as it were. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Which is so simple, isn't it? It's noticing the difference between what you look like Mm. to others and in the mirror, which is obviously a person with a face, and what you look like from your own point of view. And I don't see my face here. Uh, Instead, I see your face and the rest of the view. And that's my first person point of view. And that is just... uh, who one is, is looking out of this single eye. And uh, the experiments that you mentioned are just very simple exercises in attention. Uh, They're not anything to believe or even feel. They're they're much more simple and obvious than that. And I say that I, I don't accept anyone can't get the point. Look for your face now. Look, don't think about it. Do you see your face? I don't. What Absolutely do not. <laughs> no. And what do you see instead? You see the whole room or exactly, the whole seat. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. I think it was in one of your books where you were like, your face, where you think your face is, is replaced by the scene that's on yes. you right now, the appearance. And everyone knows this. You've never seen your face where you are. And uh, you've seen it in the mirror and other people see it and cameras take pictures of it. But that's it several feet away. And what we're doing here is bringing our attention home to the place you're looking out of. Do you see yourself looking out of two little windows or one open, boundless, frameless space? Yes, well, that, obviously. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, and when you're with someone like I'm with you now, then when I'm looking at you, I have your face and not Richard. I mean, mm-hmm. I know on the screen I can see two, but mm-hmm, if I'm just mm-hmm. looking at you, it's face to no face, isn't it? Exactly. Yes. Face to we, no face. Yeah. That changed 
everything for me. When I started approaching interactions, business meetings, family interactions like that, you know, with my children. And that's, I practiced a lot with my kids because I felt less self-conscious with them (laughs) to be able to see like, there's their face. I see their face, but here where this is looking from is just face. So it's never, it's never face-to-face confrontation. It's always face to space or object to space. And that's love. That is love, you see. Uh, And this is very simple, very accessible, but very deep. Mm. And you see, your children, when we're we're babies, we're pre-verbal and you've never... When you look in the mirror, that's not you. You're just space. You're at large. You're open for the world and for your mom and for your dad and all Mm. of that. And as we grow up, through language we learn kind of to see ourselves from outside and as it were take that image in the mirror and pull it out and flip it the other way around and put it on and imagine you're behind a face well you have to do that to understand your place in the world and your kids if they're young kids are, they are yeah. learning to put their faces on aren't they yes exactly but, you know, is they've got no trouble being headless <laughs> <laughs> it's getting it's so, the head on this yes, issue. It's so funny watching my three-year-old son, who's very inquisitive, um, become a, an ego, you know? And yes. there's been times um, here recently where he was sitting at the kitchen counter and I haven't talked about this kind of stuff extensively at all with him. I just try to live from that space. Um, yes. However, whenever he's upset, I do tell him to like, we go in and we find our love and feel that. But this was completely out of left field. He was sitting at the kitchen counter and he says... He closed his eyes and he said, are we real? And I'm like, what are you? He said, are we alive? And then he opened his eyes and he closed his eyes again. And it's like, because he couldn't see anything, including himself, he's like, is any, like, are we here? Is this real? Because I said, well, I don't understand. And he's like, well, is this real? Are we, are we real? And I'm like, yes, yes. (laughs) kind (laughs) of. I didn't even know how to explain any of this, you know, to him. I just said, yes, honey. And, you know, continue to make dinner. But I thought that was interesting. Those are the kinds of questions that, you know, if you're on a spiritual path, you're asking, but you don't think about three-year-olds contemplating that. Well, you see, I think when you realize that from your own point of view, your space for the world, which you are, then when you're with a child that age, you understand where they're coming from. Mm. And, you know, if I close my eyes now, the world has disappeared. And if I open them, it reappears in the nothingness. Yeah. Now, uh, as an infant, you play with that. You make the world disappear, you make it reappear. And because I'm aware of my headless true nature, I understand mm-hmm. that that happens, you see. Mm-hmm. Then as you grow up, uh, you become more and more aware, self-conscious of what you are for others, and uh, you are the one in the mirror. So by the time we're adults, we identify with the one on the screen and the one in the mirror and our job and name and age and all of that. And society, that's what society tells us we are, which we are for society that and you have to understand that and take responsibility mm-hmm. for yourself. But at that third stage, of the adult, the baby, the child, the adult, we repress awareness of our spacious true nature and we deny it and we just overlook it. We're just, uh, we're just unconscious of this open space and imagine being behind a face. And most people are in that uh, kind of hallucinatory state. Yes, Halluc- exactly. Yeah, exactly. you know, and hallucinating. <laughs> oh, it does, because that's head-to-head confrontation. Yeah. So now if I'm in that state now, you see, unlike when you're with your child, your child gives you permission to be headless. Yes. Yeah, it's just lovely. You take that face in, that your child is taking your face in, it's lovely. But as adults, no, no, we're face-to-face, we confront each other, and that is our disease. Everybody is thinking that we're confronting each other, you see. And the headless way is saying, well, we've got that one going. We understand we are separate, but let's reawaken to our true nature. And that, uh, you know, when you when you become aware of that, then actually it's not confrontation anymore. I've exactly. got your face. Exactly. And it's most beautiful, no distance. No distance. Yeah, and it's no difference, sick. not two, no right? Not That's two. the oneness. That's the oneness that we talk about in other traditions, right? That's right. And uh, you see, this is not then denying the reality of your so- separate self. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is having both. 
uh, you're not reverting to the baby when you know you're not aware of your separate self. That's ridiculous and impossible. Mm -hmm. So you have both. So I'm aware I'm Richard in society, but privately I'm now aware of this wonderful secret that I'm built open for the world, exactly. that when I'm driving, I'm still and the scenery flows through me. Yes. I that? use that one too, especially well, um, on train rides to New York. I used to yes. live in DC and that whole trip, it's like three and a half hours. The entire time I would practice like looking and viewing the scene as moving through me, moving through consciousness, as opposed to Nikki being on the train and going to New York. It, it makes it less taxing. On you. <laughs> it does. It's, it's, yeah. And it's less stressful and it's mm -hmm. fun. Yeah. And you see it, it when you see you've no face, it's like a veil mm. is taken away and you, you are in direct, direct contact with the world. And it has so many beautiful uh, surprises, doesn't it? Uh, yes, it does. You know, I, I'm sorry. I just wanted to interject very quickly and it might seem like a very, very, very <laughs> this might seem like a huge diversion, but Kanye West, his very first video, uh, I think it was his first video. It's at least the most popular one from his early days, All Falls Down. He shot it from first person point of view. And I don't know if you're familiar, Richard, but when I first started reading your work and Douglas Harding's work, I immediately thought about that music video and went back and watched it on YouTube. So guys, it's All Falls Down, Kanye West, um, and you can watch it and just, it's very clear what Richard is speaking about right now, because the only time Kanye sees his own face is when he walks past a reflective surface, like um, the window of a car or the bathroom mirror, and you finally see him rapping. But any other time, all you're seeing is what's on view, which is the person that he's with. You see his legs, you see his arms, but you're looking out from where his head is, right? So yes. you're seeing yes. that open view and that's always our perspective but usually we're seeing ourselves as others see us and that's why we feel self-conscious which the song was about being self-conscious well there you go you see and and uh, i think uh, people instinctively know this because yeah. it's what you are and uh this space that I'm looking out of has not got my name on it or my gender or my nationality or anything. It's the same as yours, right? Exactly. Has no boundary, right? No color, no nothing. Okay. There's nothing here. <laughs> space for the world. Now that is, uh, it's, it, 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 you see, the, the thing about the headless way is that it's not reliant on words a lot of spiritual teachers are reliant on words teachings and so you get all caught up in trying to understand what they say and then you think you've got it and then you lose it and it is uh, uh, rather challenging at least right. for me right but so this when, experience this direct pointing um it's not even an experience right is that like how would you how could we define this if it can well, be I, I would say, yeah, I'd say it's an experience, but it's not uh, understanding or feeling. Mm. And one of the things that confuses people is that you, sometimes when they, uh, as you can do now, because the only time you can be aware of it is now, if you look for the place you're looking out of right now, you see that you don't see anything. You're looking out of this big open window. And then people go, well, I don't feel anything. And you see, you say, exactly. <laughs> say, exactly. Well, 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 what's the good of that then? Well, first of all, it's true, you see. And if we are reliant on, you know, it's got to feel something, most people won't feel it. And even if you do feel it, you'll lose it. Uh, so it is a bit deceptive because it's so kind of down to earth and factual in a way mm -hmm. and not emotional. Uh, but the thing is that if you, uh, continue with it and get into the habit of being aware that you're still as the scenery moves, that you're face to no face with others, that you're looking out of the single eye, that when you close your eyes, it's very clear you've no boundary, everything is within you. Then this uh, becomes uh, more and more natural to live and be aware of this. And then it will give you everything you need in terms of feelings and understanding and all of that. You know, you've got to go for the very simple truth and trust that, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I, I would say it's an experience. It's, it's uh, your own experience of yourself, isn't it? Yes, yes. yes. 
tell me how you came to this headlessness. Like what was your spiritual journey um, up until, up until you started discovering this and then teaching this? Well, I got interested, like lots of people, when I was a boy uh, from a teacher who told an old story from northern England from the 8th century or 9th century about a bird flying in a a king's hallway in, in the winter and flying out the other window. And saying that was like life, you know, you, you come in out of the darkness, you live your life and you go out. And I thought, what is out that window? <laughs> nice. <laughs> you, you, you know, that, mm-hmm. what, that is the deep question, isn't it? Where do we come from? Yeah. What, what What is, where does it all come from? Right. So I was inspired and I was a Christian uh, in that tradition. Mm-hmm. And that, that didn't give me what I needed because I wanted to, to wake up. I wanted to find out who I really was, if I put it in that language. And I got interested in Buddhism in the late 60s. Uh, and then I went to the Buddhist Society Summer School and met Douglas Harding, and I'd never heard of him. And uh, I was 17. I went with my brother, and it was all very confusing until I met Douglas did a workshop one afternoon and got us to point. You know, you point out at things and you look. It's an experiment. And then you point back at the place you're looking out of, and the listener can do this as well as the viewer. Mm-hmm. You point directly. I mean, it's, it's embarrassing. You say, no, I'm not going to do that. But you point directly back. And what are you pointing at? And no one can tell you but you. And it's just open space. Well, I, I, I did that and I could get that. And it. Did you get it immediately? Well, I don't remember much about it. But you see, you do get it immediately. It felt like it took me three months to get it immediately. I was around, yeah. I kept reading it and I kept watching your videos and I could understand <laughs> what you were saying. But it took, it, I was sitting in bed one night late and I was looking at my iPad and it was the only light in the room. And it was then that I could see since there was an object so close to me, that yeah. white light and that object so close, well, I could notice I, that there was... Thank God for oh, iPads. Exactly. <laughs> I was like, oh, oh, and I laughed. <laughs> Enlightened by an iPad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you see, I, I, I be a bit provocative, but I'll say that you got it the first time, but you didn't know. You yeah. Didn't, it didn't understand what it meant. Exactly. But you can't see your head, so you get it. Uh, you yeah. see, I just won't accept that people don't get it. I say, I you, hear you. It, I hear that. Yeah, you just didn't. You see, so, uh, there are quite a lot of people who will see this and don't go on with it because it doesn't mean anything to them. Mm-hmm. And how you get it to mean something to someone, I don't know, except you live from it and you communicate. And I'm so grateful for, to you, Nikki, for this conversation because the work is to get it out. Yeah. Because it, it's not rocket science and everyone, I believe, should have the opportunity of seeing who they really are. What they do with it is up to them. But if they haven't even come across it, they don't have that choice. Exactly. So that the more that we can put it out like you are doing and uh, sh- make available the experience and then, you know, trust people to do with it what they like. But I would say that uh, it took you a while to recognize what it was you were experiencing. Exactly. Because I could feel the truth. I mean, I knew what you were saying was right. I knew that that was my experience. And I could even experience it when I was, um, I had a daughter um, that was, how old was she at the time? Uh, Three. She was a baby. And so I would take her out every single day and read walk. And I would do that experiment where I'm, you know, seeing the scene flow through the space. And it was much easier when this body is in motion than when I was sitting and like pointing back and trying. Yeah. However, the mirror experiment, looking, you know, at the reflection of Nikki, yes. um, also the face to no face, the face to yes. space with my daughter that young, yes. um, but also the experiment for persons that are blind. That one yes. opened up a lot for me. And it felt like it even for my meditation practice, it all of a sudden like very much informed that, you know, and in this experiment, um, they share to make a fist, to ball up your fist, to close your eyes, you know, if you are not blind, to close your eyes, to ball up your fist and to hold it in front of your face. And you hold it there and you tighten that fist so that you get a lot of pressure and a lot of tension there. And you're focused 
outwardly, your attention is focused outwardly on that tension. And then you very quickly turn that attention around 180 degrees and yes. there is no tension there. So it's like no tension, tension. And that was very clear. Very, yes. very clear. Well, there you are, you see. And uh, these are all, all these experiments are on the website so people can uh, go into them there. And the uh, experiments appeal to different people at different times. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's wonderful to have so many of them uh, to explore. Yes. And uh, yes, uh, and this is, you see, marvelous because you, you get the tension there in, in your fist and you look back up your arm and there's a space here that doesn't get tense. Now, that doesn't mean now that you're trying to get rid of your tension or deny it. You're accepting it. And this is one of the big things that people get caught up in is that they think they've got to get rid of suffering or tension or the feeling of being a separate person. And as long as they've got this feeling of self-consciousness, they can't be doing it right. Well, it's just not true. You're doing it right and you feel tense. Yes. You're doing it right and you feel self-conscious. Thank you for saying that. That's yes. Good. Yes. And now you see, uh, this gives you uh, patience and compassion with yourself. You're not expecting kind of something ridiculously miraculous to happen if you right, just, right. you've no head, you know, I mean, <laughs> it, uh, uh, but uh, it, it, uh, it sort of normalizes it. You know, yeah. this is a natural stage. When you're a baby, you're headless, you don't know about your head. With a child, you're learning to put your head on, but you're not in the box yet, so you keep forgetting about your head. That's why they bump it on everything. My three-year-old yeah, bumps are. his head on every single thing, and I can remember doing that too. Oh my goodness! But oh, that's right. You don't know. You don't recognize that right. <laughs> that's on your you shoulders see. yet. <laughs> yeah, you see. So yeah. that that then you've got to keep going. You can't mm -hmm. you can't stop there. You've got to get your head on and be fully conscious of it and repress awareness of your spaciousness. Yes. You see, but hopefully we don't spend, spend too long in that third stage. Right. But we move quickly on to become aware again of our spaciousness, like your children, you see, mm -hmm. but also aware of our face. Now, that is not a sudden break into some mystical state. Mm -hmm. That is natural progression. And the progression continues. When you see who you are, at your open space, I'm looking at this single eye now, my voice is coming up nowhere, right? Exactly. You see? Exactly. Yeah, two voices in one consciousness, right? Exactly. Yeah, you see. Well, that now, uh, it, you keep, it doesn't, you don't, don't suddenly arrive and then no more development. Your understanding keeps developing. Mm -hmm. Your exploration of it from this nothingness keeps unfolding. When you meet friends, you know, it's an exchange of equals. I can't be aware of the nothingness more clearly than you. How ridiculous, right? Exactly. And so this is a non-hierarchical setup. It is, it is so profound and radical, really. Uh, a lot of the uh, problems in spirituality comes from hierarchy and someone's got it and you don't and they're telling you what to do or all of this. And looking for glitzy experiences, right? Like that, that. extreme yes. bliss, you know. Yes. And, and pay, pay me a lot of money and you can join and, you know. Mm -hmm. But the headless way is saying you get it straight away. Yeah. You get it as completely as anyone else because you can't not. Exactly. And now you live in your unique way from this, but we can share our reactions. Yes. And uh, it is, uh, it, yes, we uh, have quite a lot of online meetings a week, Zoom meetings, Headless Way meetings. And anyone interested in this Headless Way who has done the experiment, feel drawn to it, are welcome to join us. It's free. You just have to get in touch through the website with me. And one of the things that people love about this is that, uh, from the get-go, you've got it. And people come in and they've got it. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be gradually introduced to it and learn the ropes, you know. And I get emails all the time. I was one of those people. I emailed you many times over the yeah. years. Well, I love it, you see, because it's a conversation of equals about our true nature. Now, how wild is that? Yeah. It, it's just a, a marvelous, marvelous. Yeah. I love that. And I do appreciate all of your resources. One of my favorites is the app. And I, t to this day, get an alert every hour. It's a quote, mm -hmm. a random quote. And the yeah. quotes are beautiful because they come from all the different religious traditions, um, yeah. like basically commenting on the space. Like I like yeah. to think of it as 
the kingdom within. I was raised Catholic, so that yeah. very much resonates for me. Um, but I appreciate all of the quotes, and many of them have pointed me to new teachers. Ananda yeah. Maima, there's a quote, I believe, that I got from your app where it shared that her consciousness, she said, never really associated with this body, <laughs> you know? So and I, I could feel that so deeply. She said that as the body has grown and matured and the thoughts have changed and the wants and desires change, that consciousness kind of stands apart. It's not aging, you know? It doesn't have an appearance. It's not married. It's not doing, it's, it is just as it is and how it's always been and how it always will be. And as a child, yeah. me too. I remember staring at this form in the mirror and just kind of moving my head really slowly back and yeah, forth. Like, I don't that? think I'm in there, you know? So just yeah, see not. other experiences. Yeah, I, I feel less weird. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> yeah, and you see that also because the headless way is nonverbal. Yes. Uh, this means that you don't get hung up on trying to find the correct way of expressing it or feeling it or living it. Uh, you've got it, but you will think about it differently from Ananda Ma mm -hmm. or Ramana Maharshi yes. or Jesus. And the temptation is, oh my God, Ananda Ma didn't have the, you know, wasn't identified with her body and I'm identified with my body. I'm not doing it right, you know. No, that was her experience. And your experience is different. And this really is, uh, this confirms you're at, at home, that your expression will be different. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we don't have to tie ourselves in knots trying to be somebody we're not. Exactly. <laughs> Replicate experiences, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Or I, beliefs and ideas. Yeah. Well, Tell me how you anchored in this or if that's even a goal. I've seen, you know, a couple of different articles that were on the site, um, one of which recommended to just continue on with life and notice whenever you can. Others, it was more of an act of practice of trying to stay aware that that two way directional looking back at where you're looking out of and, of course, seeing the scene on view, but practicing that um, as a goal. How do you view that? And is there a way that you can try to anchor in it 100 percent of the time? Well, you'll find your own unique way. But what happened to me was all of that, really. For ex One of the things that really did help was I hung out with people who were valuing this, Douglas Harding. Whenever I used to go to Douglas's house and you, you just went as a friend and stayed, you know, I mean, it wasn't an organization. Uh, you, you didn't have to pay money. It was just friends. And that was really important. And I don't think I paid Douglas a penny in my life. You know, it was just friends. But what happens when you're around others who are seeing, like now, it's in the air, right? It's on the front burner. So, I mean, it's not difficult. To, to be aware of your single eye when you're talking about it, right? And now, associating with that type of company, right? Yeah, because it, states of mind or consciousness, if you like, is infectious. Yeah. So when you're with a baby, the baby's headless, and it's really easy to be mm -hmm. headless with the baby, isn't it? Because you, you, you don't feel self-conscious. So you just look at the baby's face, and you're being face to no face. Okay. So then the child is, is learning to put on that uh, individual identity, but isn't quite sure, we, you know, decides to be a lion today. And yeah. that's, in yeah. fact, play. <laughs> you know, you play at being a lion with a child, and that is permitted, you see. You wouldn't do it with an adult, but the child. So when you're with adults in uh, before they see who they are, everybody's playing the face game. So in other words, I'm behind a face and I'm treating you as if you're behind a face and if we're separate and you're doing the same to me. So that isn't difficult anymore. That is just what's going on exactly. all the time. Yeah. But there's still tension there that we're unaware of because it's a lot of work being well, somebody, it's... right? To pretend to be to be that only. <laughs> I know. <laughs> like, that's why when we get home, we're like, oh, thank God. Yes, thank that's God. right. I can relax now. <laughs> yeah, you don't I can have to be breathe. Now exactly. I can be me because we're never that authentic self usually, right? When we're in public, I would always, I remember in the beginning for me, I would say, okay, I'm going to practice headlessness or self-inquiry, whatever I was doing at the time. I'm going to be this love when I get out to this restaurant for this happy hour around all these people that I have to go and hang out with. And then I'd come home 
and remember, oh crap, I forgot the whole three hours I was out. Yeah, I was well, just would. Picky. It's not like that anymore, but in the beginning, it was very difficult to remember what I practiced when I was alone, yes. when I was yes. out among seeming others. <laughs> yes, well, there you go, you see. And I, I think that people like to be alone or in nature uh, because they're not being having their appearance reflected back from them by others the trees don't tell you you're a person and the mm -hmm. animals don't mm -hmm. so you naturally it's like being at home on your own exactly. it's safe or right. where you just instinctively you're not anybody you are yourself right. now uh, w when you then realize that you can do this with others uh, face to no face right Mm -hmm. But it's not a complicated thing. It, it you 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 gradually ease into it, yeah. and also if you know if you've got friends, it's very skillful to have friends who are aware of their headless nature because it's infectious mm -hmm. and it's it's completely natural, and it takes time to reap the benefits. Yeah, the experience is a hundred percent total, but the benefits take time. But I think it's skillful to hang out with others. Uh, but like any habit that you want to learn, you have to practice. Exactly. But Tell us thing, about some of those benefits that you were saying that take time to unfold. Well, before I do that, I'll just say that the thing with learning, um, say if you're learning the piano, mm -hmm. you start off a beginner and, and you never get to being perfect, right? Exactly. You know, and you ha it's it's hard work, and it's little by little. The headless way is immediate perfection. So you, it, it's quite different in a way. You're immediately aware of looking out of this open space, you see, and you you it, it, you get confidence. You're doing it right, and you're doing it perfectly from the start. So that's a different kind. You've got to keep practicing uh, but the experiments make it very hands-on you it's not unclear what you're doing face no face right. single eye right still and the scenery moving stress to no stress right. problem to no problem to no problem yeah yes yes what are the benefits i don't i i don't know sometimes it feels like there aren't any <laughs> benefits at all <laughs> you know I, I think benefits come and go like mm -hmm. Like the English sun, you know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I think that one learns over time. I mean, there are immense benefits. You know, friendships uh, based on this are just something else, you, you know, or creativity. My voice is coming out of nowhere. That's creative. This, this conversation is in the void coming out of nowhere, isn't it? It's from the first beautiful. person point of view, exactly. from the third person it's not. But from the first person it's emerging miraculously out of the void you see now that's creative now that isn't saying this is creative and this is not everything is creative so then if you're doing something quote unquote creative it's no different really exactly from this conversation or something mundane like brushing your teeth becomes enjoyable i remember reading that i believe in your book where all of a sudden now it's like oh that toothbrush is disappearing into the space yeah. and now there's minty flavors i'm like oh yeah okay yeah, let's let's do this and that's that power of now present that really yeah. made it you know, experiential for me. Yes, yes, yes. Well, I, I think uh, the, the benefits are deep and profound, mm. um, um, but they do uh, have their seasons. And uh, it is, uh, there's a lovely phrase by Kierkegaard called, uh, goes, life is lived forwards and understood backwards. And uh, you you going through an experience and you can't understand it, it has no meaning. It's only later when you look back and say, oh, now I understand something about that. So, mm -hmm. And uh, there are times in the headless life when all benefits seem to go. Yeah. Uh, and I think that uh, one then returns to the fact that it's just true. Right. It's not yeah. doesn't I can't see what good it's doing for me, but it's true. it's true. And I'm going to stick with the truth and trust it in a way. Yes. And then later on, you know, you think, well, that, that was smart. You know, I uh, that that's the only way I could have come to understand that was going through that awful experience. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Because in awful uh, experiences, so, it makes you want to like be aware of this space more to be aware of truth 
more. Yeah. Well, there you go, you see. And uh, in a way, everything then uh, points you back to who you really are. Exactly. Uh, yeah. I use everything as a trigger like that to remember yeah. what I am. And like you said earlier in the conversation about attention coming and not needing it to go or not using this practice as a way to bypass that tension. But for me, it's like I'm just now noticing that, oh, there's tension in this field that I truly am. That is one of space, you know, that yeah. is not made of tension. Um, there's an awareness of tension that has yeah. come to visit and it's okay. It's okay. Well, that it's yes, it makes it makes a difference, doesn't it? It it doesn't necessarily make the headache go away or the right. tension go, and yet one is aware that it's arising in this vast openness, and it doesn't. Exactly. Every single that. pain, I go right to this. I'm like, yeah, oh, headache. Well, oh, but there's space in that open that space. The headache is still there. But somehow, you know, it's just, it's more bearable. The suffering is gone. There's pain, but you're not suffering it. Yes. And you see, from the outside, you're in that room and I'm in this room. You know, you're an object, you're a thing Mm -hmm. in the world. But from the inside, the world is in you. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Now, I mean, yeah, that really, having said that and experienced it, you should be lying on the floor waiting for an ambulance. I exactly. mean, it, it, it is just shocking. The world is in you. Exactly. You couldn't get more different. Exactly. And of course, this is what all the great teachers are saying. But when you see it, it, and you never get used to it, right? I'm aware of it now that this whole room and conversation and you and everything is in my, you know, in, the, in my being. Right. But it blows your mind every time. It blows your, yeah. it blows your head up every single time. You're like, oh, that's right. <laughs> that's right. It's like it punctuates for me in the beginning, especially I'd be mid conversation as face to face, you know, trying to, I'm Nikki and I am trying to get this point across where we're talking about this. And then all of a sudden it's like that ego gets interrupted with this headlessness. And then I rem- I'm reminded like, a, like lightning, boom. Oh, that's right. I see their face, but there's space here. And then there's more openness, there's more compassion and more understanding. I, a few years ago, I I developed um, an exercise in workshops. I do Mm -hmm. a lot of workshops and I've been through many phases running workshops. And uh, uh, for for a long time now, they're very creative. You know, I don't have to know because I'm so familiar with them and the experiments and such fun, really. But I developed this exercise, which which goes on from the face to no face experience. Mm -hmm. Now, I my view is that it's one thing to see who you are, but when you start to communicate about it, this is a big thing. You're standing up in public and saying, "This is true about me." Mm-hmm. Now, when you say, you know, something about yourself in public, that's different from when you don't say it. Mm-hmm. Even though nothing changes about that truth, you know, it, it, it is a big thing to go public. It has an effect. It comes back to you. It's no longer private. It's a right. publicly acknowledged thing. So now when I'm saying to you, Nikki, I am space for you, I'm going public, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yes, I love that. And I'm yeah. space for you. That's right. You see, and you're going public. Now, yes. it's a natural thing. It's the truth, right? Yes, yes. Now we're bringing, we're, all we're doing is we're bringing onto the front burner the truth. Exactly. Now, the other thing that I get people to do is say, right, now put yourself in the other person's shoes. So, Nikki, from your point of view, you're wide open there. You're space for this conversation. Mm-hmm. You're looking out of open space. Everything is within you. Mm-hmm. You've got Richard's face now instead of yours, right? Mm-hmm. Yes, yes, now, yes, yes. I'm acknowledging your true nature. It's namaste, right? Ah, uh, yes, I love that. And and then I get the person, you know, then you would say, well, Richard, from your point of view. Now, don't you feel kind of seen? You know, I see. Well, yes, that is beautiful. That's yes. absolutely beautiful. And you guys, well, we, you're usually, you were doing this, I'm assuming, in person, right? Yes. Before COVID. Is that is it still effective? Oh, yes. Like, quite I, effective I, I, over I, Zoom? Yeah. yeah we had a... Um, I, uh, uh, Yesterday, we had a, a special meeting. We have mm-hmm. them every so often that I facilitate. Mm-hmm. And anyone from the Zoom groups can join, right? Nice. And this one is was the face-to-no-face thing. So we had 25 people came, mm-hmm. and I know them, you mm-hmm. know. And I facilitated pairs uh-huh. saying, I'm space for you. 
right? I am op- I'm looking at you and I have your face now. And then, and you were, it was very moving. It, oh, it is, yeah. Because it's a personal communication. I am you, Nikki. Yes. Right? I Not somewhat you. vague. I am the the one. Yeah, no, I, am, I you. am you. I love. I, you know, I have a T-shirt that says "I am you," but it's powerful to hear that out of your mouth, looking at yeah, me, and I have your face yeah. and you have mine. It's a very personal <laughs> thing, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, this guy yesterday, who I, who I know, is he's, he's delightful, uh, and uh, him and his wife, uh, and he said, you know because uh, he did it with someone and the mm-hmm. second part is the other person saying you know to to this person you are space for the world you're yes. wide open you're still you're uh, you have my face and this this friend said you know it's as if i've been waiting my whole life for someone to say that to me yes that you know, is beautiful that you are not just what you look like you're the source you're the one you were never born and you'll never die. This is true. Yeah. And you know it's true, but to have it confirmed or celebrated, uh, which is what we're doing here, isn't it? We're it celebrating. Is, it is. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's wild. It's Thank wonderful. You. Did you ever feel like naked when you started teaching this? You know, because it is so different, you know, for the average person to tune in. I'm sure some folks at home are like, Huh? But I bet you're going to Google. <laughs> you're going to get on headless.org as soon as yeah, yeah. we're done here. Because <laughs> you can feel the truth. But did you ever feel naked when you started teaching oh, and sharing? Yeah. And you came out publicly with this. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, I started uh, after I met Douglas. So I, I went to Cambridge University. And most of my time at Cambridge was not spent studying history. It was doing workshops and visiting Douglas because he lived nearby and mm. living this, you see. And uh, But uh, to begin with, uh, especially way back in the early 70s, you know, it was the weirdest thing. It's less weird now. But I, I, it took me a long time to find my own style. Yeah. Uh, but uh, and now I, you know, it, it is known just just enough so that it's not completely weird, you know. <laughs> but uh, now I enjoy it. And uh, whereas Douglas used to give long introductions to his workshops and mm-hmm. bless his, you know, bless him. And, oh, yeah. Uh, but uh, now if I start, uh, I'll probably change now, but I start, well, I'd just like you all to notice you can't see your own face. Nice. <laughs> and get right to the point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Because why not? Why? Yeah. What, you know, Let's get to the experience and then we can talk as equals rather from than there. Equals. We can talk from that space. Yeah. 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 But uh, ever you see the, the, uh, I learned a lot from Douglas and he used to uh, say, you know, uh, you can't share it wrong. You know, uh, even if you're not used to it, you're not used to the language, whatever, you, you see who you are and share that. You know, can you see your face? You know. And uh, he, 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 he lived in a village mm-hmm. in uh, Suffolk and, uh, you know, a bit out of, in, not ne- near a city, but in, the, in a village. Mm-hmm. And, but all these people used to come and stay from all over the world, you see. Wow. And there was a big shop and there was a girl in the shop. And one day Douglas went into the shop and she said, Doug, Mr. Harding, um, all these people from all over the world, Canada, Australia, America, come into the shop. You know, a little shop in the middle of nowhere, all these people, <laughs> are, and they staying with you. What do you do there, you see? Uh, and this girl was about 18. Uh, and Douglas just, he, he didn't say anything. Well, he, all he did was he looked at, he, he looked at her, and face to no face, he just said, look, there's nothing there, is there? There's nothing, my hands disappeared. It's just... Wow. And, and she came down to the house, you know. So it, it, that that's very encouraging, isn't it? You it don't is. have to go into a long philosophical explanation. Uh, but what you see, she was open to it. Right. That makes a big difference. Yeah. Now, but you can share it with anyone. With everybody. But, but what, how they respond is beyond, not your business, really. Right. You know, now when I'm sharing it with, with people, I try and be as sensitive as I can to their reaction. And if I feel resistance, you know, if I feel if they in one way or another said I'm not interested, I back off. Yeah. You know, and we talk about something else or whatever. But if it, someone is interested, then I'll go with it. Uh, and that is just being respectful. Of oh, what, yeah. You know, 
Yeah. I remember excitedly learning and finally seeing, even though I saw that first time, three months when I finally was like aware of what was happening, I started sharing with folks that were close to me and my mom, um, who's now very much on this path, who's still to this day when she's in a mirror, that's the first thing she goes to. Like, oh, there's a reflection, but there's just space here. I remember sharing with my dad, sharing with my then husband, sharing with everyone that would listen. And I'm sure some people thought I was crazy, but other people were very interested and started researching the themselves and practicing themselves. And I shared on my blog on Curly Nikki, a hair blog, all of a sudden I'm writing an article with that Kanye West video. On and I'm like, no I know hair. this is weird, guys, but look, <laughs> <laughs> look, and that was like back in 2014. And I still had a lot of filters in the way that I shared because I was scared to share, yeah. um, but I felt that it was necessary to share. Well, I, I fully understand that. Uh, and it's not surprising. But, you know, uh, that as you've experienced now, uh, there's nothing like sharing it when you see the person's face light up. I mean, I, mean, I have, I experience this a lot. I'm very blessed, you know, uh, again and again, and I get emails. But, but to be with someone and, and you suddenly see them for the first time, it's like that a veil. That must be so cool. Well, uh, you, with your mum. You yeah, know, it, it, yeah it, uh, that's true. And everyone's different, you know. But uh, I, I sometimes think, gosh, these, these spiritual teachers, do they get that? You see, uh, this is so physical. It's not right. about... Right, ideas. it's not the words and sitting, no. and sitting with it uh, in your and, mind, <laughs> going to search. There's no, there's no disguising it. When someone sees it, you know, that you. Oh yeah. It's either oh. on or off, isn't it? Yeah. You know, that's one of the benefits too, at least here. And like you said, it's the benefits change, and they're not always the same. But at times, I notice that when that awareness comes, that there's just space here, the thoughts slow down. They quiet down. There's not as many thoughts. And they might start right back up again. But in that moment of recognition, there's a quiet. Yes. And like the, the stress happening in the space or the movement happening in the stillness, the thoughts happening are happening in the no thought, right? Exactly. Yeah. So it's like you become that, aware of that silence that's always present, right? Even when the thoughts are there. That's right. And uh, in fact, in, in, as I understand it, in Zen Buddhism, they call this the no mind, out of which mind comes. So just as my oh, voice, yes. yeah, so this validates thinking uh, yeah. and doesn't make it a, a bad thing. Just as my voice is coming out of the silence now, and I don't know what it's going to say next, you see, so my thoughts and feelings are coming out of this no mind. Mm -hmm. And uh, don't, don't, uh, thing me. There's not a, a box here. So yeah. that changes one's relationships with one's mind. And, uh, you know, my mind, it gets into knots every so often. And, oh, but yeah. It's like your fist, isn't it? And oh, yeah. uh, thank God we've got this. That's a very therapeutic, you see, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. It yeah. is. It's beautiful. Well, we're just about out of time, but I want you to tell everyone how they can find you, how they can join your workshops and practice this headlessness. Well, go to headless.org. Uh, you'll get a lot of resources, plus a link to our YouTube channel, and there's lots of videos there. And uh, the experiments on the website, of course. You'll also uh, have a, uh, you'll find my contact details all over the place on the website. So if you do want to hang out with other headless people <laughs> on Zoom. <laughs> headless we've got, community. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, we've got seven or eight meetings a week. They're free. They're an hour. And I will, if you're interested in these and uh, uh, you've done an experiment, I'll send you details and, and people are, you know, welcome to join. Uh, so, uh, yeah. That yeah. is so beautiful. Thank you for that service that you're providing. Also, I don't know, is the app still available? Is yes. that still something? Okay, because I know I've had it for so many years. I've never even checked to see. So get the app, download it on um, iTunes store. It is absolutely amazing and it's that i think that was free too if it wasn't it was yes, cheap. <laughs> it's free. no it's free yeah, yeah. Uh, and you'll get a link to that on our website and we've got podcasts and nice. uh, so all that kind of uh, the resources are available through the the website but thank we you need Nikki, reminders very... like that you well know, we do we really do and i do as much as anyone we need mm -hmm. uh support from each other Absolutely. and this is the wonder of the one becoming many isn't it yeah uh, it's a miracle and a mystery but the one is yeah. many yeah speaking speaking with two voices here yeah 
beautiful voices. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Richard, for joining me today. Thank you all at home.